Hi everyone, my name is Max and happy World Carnivorous Plant Day. Today we have Dr. Barry Rice. Dr. Rice, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hello, my name is Barry Rice. I am a long-term carnivorous plant grower, carnivorous plant scientist, and conservationist. Um, I'm also a, a, an astronomy professor of a type of astronomy referred to as astrobiology, which is the study of what life is, how life has evolved on our planet, and places that are necessary for life's, life to develop, and also where life might exist elsewhere in our galaxy. I'm also a long-term geek who thinks that it's important, it's our personal imperative to improve ourselves as well as our understanding of the universe. Can you tell us what astrobiology and carnivorous plants have in common? In my interest in carnivorous plants and uh, my life as an astrobiologist, you see, you see, life itself is this vigorous, tenacious syndrome. Organisms have to do whatever they ha can to, to, to survive. And I think it's fascinating to see how different sorts of life forms function. Now, um, on this planet, um, all life as we know it, it's carbon-based, and uh, requires, uh, ha all life has to have a mechanism for getting the carbon that it needs to survive, other nutrients to survive, and also energy. Now you, I'm guessing, are a chemo um, heterotroph, which means that you get the um, energy that you need and the uh, carbon and other elements that you need to survive from eating other organisms. Uh, meanwhile, plants, conventional plants, are photo autotrophs. They get the energy they need from the sunlight and they can feed themselves by just pulling the nutrients directly out of the soil. Carnivorous plants, on the other hand, are to a certain degree um, photoheterotrophs. They get the energy they need from sunlight, but then they get the nutrients from other organisms. They hunt. I think it's so cool that life even on this planet can do such surprising, um, can have such surprising strategies for survival. And if they can do that on this planet, what bizarre strategies might life um, uh, use in order to survive on other planets? Why do you grow carnivorous plants? So, as a scientist, why do I grow carnivorous plants? Why do I like to grow carnivorous plants? Well, um, first, first off, it's challenging. They're hard to grow. They're not easy, and so I'm attracted to the challenge. That said, I, where I live in the Central Valley of California, I don't grow very many carnivorous plants in my backyard because the conditions are just so horrible and they're, they, they, they look like they've got, they give me a headache looking at them when they're not looking their best. But in a greenhouse at uh, UC Davis, where I do a lot of work, grow carnivorous plants and they look really nice. Uh, but why do I, grow, what are the benefits of growing carnivorous plants? Well, one is, is you can learn so much about the plants by growing them. You're living with them all the time and so you can see things. For example, I've got this, this is a, a specimen of Saracenia purpurea, subspecies venosa, and um, this is during the winter months as I'm recording this, and so it's a, it's a little, they look a little crabby right now, but look at how bright red they, these plants are. Normally during the growing season, they're um, green with red veins, but during the winter months, they turn deep, deep red, and that's really fascinating. It's interesting to just to watch that happen. Another reason that I like to grow carnivorous plants is because um, I get to experiment upon them. I'm constantly experimenting, learning about these things. Uh, so, for example, let's talk about this this red perp. Why is it turning red? So I can vary the conditions. I can vary whether um, it's turning red because the winter months are cold. Is it because the light levels are changing? What's changing to make this plant be different um, from maybe a plant that I'm growing in a terrarium. If I grow some plants like this in the terrarium during the winter months, do they turn red as well? Do these sorts of experiments constantly find out?
Um, and um, also, you know, it's challenging. You learn from them and do experiments on them. But I like having them around. I just like looking at carnivorous plants. And so it's a pleasure having carnivorous plants in my environment so I can look at them and just say, aren't you cool? Look at you doing what you're doing. Are carnivorous plants collections of form of conservation? Yeah, uh, I might upset some people when I say this, but for the most part, no. Uh, so many carnivorous plant growers have collections and they think to themselves, uh, my carnivorous plant collection is an ark that it, if something happens to the wild, at least my plants will still will still be in existence. And I used to think that as well when I was growing carnivorous plants uh, in greater numbers than I am now. But, but you know, really, there are two flaws with this perspective. The first is you need really massive facilities in order to have genetic diversity uh, to really preserve a species or a taxon. One or two plants is not the same thing as protecting the species. And, but then you think, well, yeah, but in the worst case scenario, you know, even then, another problem with carnivorous plant collections as being an idea about conservation, um, at least private carnivorous plant collections, is the longevity of the collection. If you're thinking about conservation, you really have to be thinking about things in the time scale of hundreds, thousands of years, is really what you're trying to do, right? I see carnivorous plant collections come into existence and then they disappear with the life, with the time scale of a human lifespan or fraction thereof. So 40 years or something like that is a typical carnivorous plant collection lifespan. That's not really conservation. Now, that's different from large facilities that you've got a, a, a big garden, uh, you know, like a public garden, like the Atlanta Botanic Gardens growing large numbers of car carnivorous plants for a long different uh, for a long time scale. that's a different sort of thing you know even i've got questions about things like seed banks you hear people talk about protecting organisms through seed banks you need a lot of seeds to, in order to capture the the genetic diversity right um now there are the occasional exceptions to this i know i've heard about them you know aldrovanda a population of aldrovanda was protected because it was in cultivation but these are these stories are so rare the exceptions really prove the rule that for the most part carnivorous plant collections certainly not privately owned carnivorous plant plant collections don't really constitute conservation now if the grower who maintains the collection gets a lot of personal fulfillment and is a conservationist as a result great or um, Carnivorous plant collections can be great ways as of, of demonstrating to the public how cool carnivorous plants are and how the ones in the wild should be protected. So yes, outreach as avatars for the plants in the wild, that's, a, that's real conservation. But not so much plants in a pot. How can citizen scientists help carnivorous plants? You don't have to be a PhD. You don't have to uh, be a research scientist to help with carnivorous plants. Uh, uh, citizen scientists can help in a lot of different ways. You know, one thing you can do is now. I always think about things in the field, but if you're a person who loves to see carnivorous plants in the wild, if you track them down, kind of tracking down new locations, identifying uh, new counties. Uh, new county records for carnivorous plants can extend our knowledge. Always, whenever possible, you know, work with the local relevant or national nonprofit organizations or the universities or the agencies, the government agencies that might be overseeing areas. Become a super volunteer. You know, and that, that doesn't even have to be a, if you're just interested in field work. You know, you can coordinate with the local Audubon Society or the um, chapter of the Nature Conservancy and become a super volunteer in the offices there and uh, work in outreach or some other aspect of carnivorous plant uh, conservation. And you'll be doing more than just with carnivorous plants. You know, you can help with all sorts of other um, relevant issues. Um, 
if you're out in the field and you notice something that doesn't seem right, you know, pig damage from feral pigs or whatever, alert the appropriate agencies. Um, if you do a lot of observations and you use programs like iNaturalist or things like that, report that information, but also make sure that your data is appropriately obscured. Uh, unfortunately, there are poachers that love to use stuff like iNat, um, iNat and use that as a guide for places to poach plants. We're trying to figure out how to blur information appropriately on, on iNaturalist. And not only if you find carnivorous plants, but if you find plants that grow with carnivorous plants, that can also be a way that poachers can track down locations uh, through iNaturalist. So you can help them. Um, you don't want to you don't want to hurt the carnivorous plants with your interest right also if you're a horticulturist and you make an observation write it up publish it in a journal like a carnivorous plant newsletter or some other local journal that you might be part of that are focused on carnivorous plants i remember a long long time ago um, i was writing uh, i was observing uh, Biblis species of Biblis that I was growing in my in my own greenhouse, and I noticed that I couldn't cross very um, different varieties of Biblis. And Alan Lowry used that as supporting evidence that there were actually different species of Biblis that hadn't been descri described in nature yet, or de described in um, in journals. So there are a lot of different ways that citizen scientists can help with carnivorous plants. How can carnivorous plant hobbyists help in conservation? can help in conservation in so many ways. You know, uh, first, you can do things like supporting NGOs, nonprofit organizations like the Nature Conservancy, the International Carnivorous Plant Society, the Audubon, the NASC, uh, all these sorts of organizations. You can um, support them financially, you can become a volunteer, you can become a super volunteer with them, which is what I call, you know, when you, you're so popular there that you go and you spend all, all your spare time at those places. You can be a very a huge support for those things. If you like to go and see the plants of the wild, which is so much fun, always, always make sure that you're within the you're within the law, that you're not trespassing, that um, you're not venturing off the path in a way that's going to get uh, conservation workers um, upset at you. You know, we need to show the carnivorous plant community, the members have to show an overabundance of politeness to these people who are working in NGOs and in agencies, federal agencies or state agencies, because there has been such a bad history in so many cases of, of carnivorous plant growers uh, uh, <laughs> running afoul of the law or getting in trouble or just getting bad blood animosity because of the occasional, occasional poacher. Uh, it's, it's, we really have to work to, to make sure that we're uh, maintaining good relationships with conservationists who are our best allies in carnivorous plant land. Right? Watch out for poachers, even within your own community. You know, you want to police your own community if you, and I love to see it when I see on Facebook, people are saying, oh, look, these plants are being sold. This, don't buy any plants from such and such location because they're obviously poached. We have to police our own community. Even in another way, though, more positive tone, of speak out for the plants at outreach events. If there are, um, there are garden shows and there's no displays about carnivorous plants. Set up a, play, a display for carnivorous plants. Speak out for the plants. And finally, don't forget about them. Don't forget about carnivorous plants. They're part of our planet. They represent fascinating, important biodiversity. And they're, if you know the analogy of canaries in the coal, coal mine, they're important indicators of the quality of our environment. With, when carnivorous plants are, are, are extra, um, go extinct in the wild, that means that something else is going on with that habitat that you got to pay attention to. And so carnivorous plant growers, carnivorous plant enthusiasts, carnivorous plant scientists can keep track of the health of our planet.